This is the Advanced Brain Podcast with third-generation neurotechnology pioneer, entrepreneur, best-selling author, music producer, keynote and TEDx speaker, Alex Doman. Improve your mental wellness as Alex sits down with the leading thought leaders of our time about how to optimize your brain, body, and life with the latest and most powerful tools to help you reach your unlimited potential. This episode was previously recorded and released as part of the Sound Brain Fitness Series and is being re-released here in the Advanced Brain Podcast. Now, listen in and discover how to become the best version of yourself with Alex Doman. Welcome, everybody. This is Alex Doman with Advanced Brain Technologies. Uh, We're going to go ahead and get this evening's call going. Uh, Tonight's call is the auditory brain with our guest, Dr. Seth Horowitz. Seth, you're here with us? I'm here with you, Alex. How are you? Hi, Seth. Good evening. Where are you calling in from tonight? I'm calling in from Warwick, Rhode Island. Warwick, Rhode Island, and I'm calling here from Advanced Brain Technologies in Ogden, Utah. So great to uh, hear your voice from across the country. Um, what we're what we're going to do is do a little welcome and introduction, and go ahead and get our call started for everybody. So I really want to welcome everybody that's uh, on the phone and listening online. Um, I know that we have many new callers with us tonight, uh, some folks that uh, may not be familiar with Advanced Brain Technologies and many of you that have been involved with our company for many years. So as we kick off this new series, I just wanted to take a minute to tell you a little bit about who we are at Advanced Brain and what this series is all about. So Advanced Brain Technologies is a company I founded back in 1998 building on my family's three generations of pioneering contributions to the field of human development. Our vision is to transform the life of every person by making sound brain fitness universally attainable. What we do here at ABT is create very innovative evidence-based solutions for people actively looking to make a positive change in their life or the lives of others. So our vision is really about helping people improve their lives in any way that is related to sound and improving sound brain fitness. It makes me real, real pleased to introduce this inaugural call of the Sound Brain Fitness Series of ABT uh, Teleseminars. Uh, This is a new monthly series uh, that will be taking place on the first Wednesday of each month, and these are 60-minute teleseminars that cover wide-ranging topics intended to help people transform their lives through a better understanding of sound, music, and the brain. So each month, I'm going to invite an industry expert to join me as a guest to focus on a specific topic. These topics are picked on inquiries and questions that we get from callers about the things that you're, you're most interested in learning about and the folks that you want to hear from. So uh, tonight's call uh, is a very exciting one uh, because it's about the auditory brain. And the auditory brain is an important topic for us because our, our world is about sound brain fitness. It is about improving our brain performance, our health, and our wellness by attending to and consciously using the environment to improve our lives. And tonight's guest is somebody that knows a whole lot about this, but before I introduce him, I want to talk to you a little bit about what you can expect on tonight's agenda. Uh, We will, uh, after I introduce our topic and our guest, uh, our guest will spend about half an hour to 35 minutes um, presenting on the topic of the auditory brain. Then following that, we're going to move to a question and answer session. We're going to address a number of the questions that were submitted when you registered and then open the call up for those of you that are on the phone to ask our guest questions live or myself if you like. Then at the end of the call, we'll make some announcements and we will wrap this up promptly at 9 9 p.m. Eastern Time. So a little bit about tonight's call with our guests. So our topic is the auditory brain. So we're going to be talking about all things brain, and I want to tell you about uh, the individual that's going to share this information with us. Uh, Dr. Seth Horowitz is an assistant research professor at Brown University in the Department of Ecology and Environmental Biology. He has a master's in psychology with a Ph.D. in human neuroscience from Brown University. He works and publishes extensively in comparative and human hearing, balance, and sleep research. 
His work has been funded by grants from the NIH, the National Science Foundation, the Deafness Foundation, and NASA. He has taught undergraduate and graduate level classes in anim animal behavior, neuroethology, brain development, the bi biology of hearing, and the musical mind. In his role as the chief neuroscientist at Neuropop, he has applied his basic research skills to real-world applications ranging from health and wellness to educational science outreach. His work has been covered in popular media, including NPR's Here and Now, the Boston Globe, Wired.com and numerous other online and print publications, and his book, which I'm so excited about, The Universal Sense, How Hearing Shapes the Mind, will be released by Bloomsbury in September of this year. So Seth has become a friend. Uh, he's a member of the Advanced Brain Technology Scientific Advisory Board and become a collaborator on new sound and music projects with ABT. Uh, Seth, we're just so pleased to have you take, thank you for taking some time out of your evening to uh, share with our guests tonight. Thank you, Alex. And I just want to say for everybody that <clears throat> Alex sort of gave me hope again to the ability to apply really basic, as he said, evidence-based research into clinical applications, not for NIH big studies, but for things that can actually impact people's lives on a daily basis. So thank you very much for the opportunity tonight, Alex. Well, and that's that's what it's all about for us. You know, the basic the basic science provides so much to further our understanding, but it you know it's about the application of this on on real people and how we make an effect in their lives on a day to day basis. So I, I'm really thrilled to have somebody that comes from your mindset, Seth. That's really looking to translate this information in the laboratory. Uh, to to affect each of us in our lives. And, and that's the reason I invited uh, Seth to join us and discuss the auditory brain. Uh, this man has such a perfect understanding uh, of how the human auditory system works uh, from a cellular level up to a functional level. Uh, I'm just thrilled to have you. So, Seth, what I'd like to do is go ahead and turn the time over, over to you to um, you know talk about this this auditory brain and why why we're wired for sound. Okay, thank you. First, I got to tell everybody that I've been studying this for actively for 20 years, and I've been involved directly in interest in sound in way too many decades that I want to think about. And if I have another 50 years, I might begin to actually have a handle on it. We are so deeply embedded in sound in our daily lives, and it affects so much of our brain, our behavior, our culture, our society that we don't know all the answers. And we're only now getting to the point, 10 years after the decade of the brain, with major advances in, in, advances in everything from genetics to neural imaging to physiological studies and behavioral studies, that we're beginning to be able to apply very basic research to specific problems that emerge in daily life. But there are always more questions. So I'm not going to have the opportunity to do more than just sort of skim over most of this. I hope you'll have specific questions for me afterwards. But to give you an idea of why I really got interested in this, many years ago, 1980, I was uh, I left Columbia University, sort of confused about what I wanted to do, and went off to become a musician. And like many people in the eight, early 80s, I got very involved in computers and music, even though the computers back then were less powerful than even your watches, let alone a cell phone. And one of the things that stuck with me and made me realize that I had to study this was a very peculiar event. I had a very old Juno 106 synthesizer, one of these things that was less digital than my cat. It was all analog oscillators, and it was attached to a very large, very poorly tuned amplifier. And I was trying to create fractal sound, something that no one was thinking about at the time, but that there would be sounds that would keep changing themselves in real time. And it was attached to this very, very large amplifier. And just as I thought I had everything set just so, my cat jumped on the synthesizer and completely messed everything up and rather intelligently escaped. So I decided the cat probably had just as much chance of coming up with a fractal sound as I did. So I played the sound, and suddenly it felt very strange. And I turned around to face this amplifier, and it felt even stranger. And a moment later, I threw up all over my keyboard. And this was the first hint I had that there's a deep physiological connection between things that you hear, sound and vibration, and things that have nothing to do with hearing. 
it may be a slightly gross example, but it fascinated me and trapped me. I kept being a musician, and the idea of sound being something more than just listening to the music that you listen to on your Walkman back in those days stuck with me. So I started working as a dolphin, a dolphin trainer, volunteer, and I got fascinated with animal behavior, especially about their calling behavior. Dolphins and some other animals like bats actually see or can see with their ears. They'll form three-dimensional models of the world. What I got interested in was the fact that a very specific problem emerged, that, you know, if, if you've been to a show, you've seen dolphins, and you know that dolphins are very intelligent animals, and they echolocate, which means that they can perceive the sound much like medical ultrasound can. They send out very high frequency, very loud sound, and they understand the echoes coming back as a shape. Well, there was, uh, this was the New York Aquarium, and they had two different tanks. One was outside in the summer, three dolphins, lots of them, lots of interaction, and they had a winter tank. And the winter tank was the same amount of space, same amount of interaction, same food, but even though everything else seemed to match, they were much more aggressive, they were much more unhappy, and so my first research project in sound was trying to figure out why the dolphins would be unhappy in one tank and not in another. And it turned out that the only difference between the two was that the pumps that kept the water filtered were directly attached to their winter tank, or the summer tank, it was connected by accordion hose. And it turned out that dolphins were picking up the 60 hertz, the very low frequency rumble, that was making them nauseous. This is somewhat similar to what humans who work in construction, or have had the unfortunate experience of being in a room with a, with a fan that has a broken blade, called vibroacoustic signal. Low frequency, loud amplitude, repetitive sound actually makes you ill. The problem was that dolphins are not supposed to hear low frequency sounds. They're supposed to, according to all of the data, they were really supposed to be cut off probably around a few hundred hertz, about the bottom of the human speech range. But my data showed that they were actually hearing this, and this caused some excitement in the hearing community, some of it good, some of it bad. But mostly, it made me realize that hearing is a much more complicated thing than anybody, even the professionals, realized. I had professional dolphin audiologists telling me, no, they can't be hearing it, and I had people from the Navy saying, yes, they absolutely can. And we've noted problems with our sonar systems, low frequency around dolphins and whales. So there's always something new that you can learn just by looking at something from an auditory perspective. So beyond dolphins, I started working with other animals. I worked extensively with frogs, which were nowhere near as fun or sexy as dolphins are. But they taught me some rather remarkable things. Frogs, you know, you may look at them and just say, okay, they're little green things. They sit in the field and they croak. But you're looking at an animal that's 300 million years old. That his entire social life is based on sound. A deaf frog will never breed. A deaf frog will never be able to compete, will get chased away by his neighbors. So the base and the basic way that frogs hear is the way humans hear low frequency sound. On the other hand, later on I started working with bats. Now bats seem very exotic acoustically. They actually they have they do see. They have about as good visual acuity as any evening-based small animal. But it's not very good to resolve, and they're startled by bright light, but they build an incredibly complex three-dimensional world just from sound. As a matter of fact, one of the projects I worked with was trying to figure out what is a bat's world. If they're using sound to build it up, humans are visual animals. How can we perceive what the bats are seeing with sound? And what it turned out to be was, I want you all to imagine the room that you're in right now. And everything in it is made of glass, crystal glass, highly reflective, very transparent. And now all the lights go out. And all you have in your hand is a strobe light or a flashlight that you flicker. The bat's auditory world is like walking through a world of highly reflective substances, and they're flashing a flashlight on. And they're flying, just cruising around, they flash it very slowly. They get reflections. They hear the echoes and they see the basic structure of the world. But when they start hunting, or they have to avoid another bat or a researcher with a net, they start strobing their sound really loud and really fast. 
and they get a very detailed three-dimensional view of the world by just the reflections of the sound. Now, all of this sounds very exotic, but what does this have to do with humans? We're interested in the human experience. We're the ones who make the sound level meters and make the iPods, and the ones who are studying all these other animals. But what it boils down to is one thing that absolutely fascinated me when I started graduate school. And it was based on a question that my advisor asked. And that was, are there any deaf vertebrates? A vertebrate is just an animal with a backbone. So we're not going to talk about squids or octopuses. I started doing the research. It's like, okay, what animals have what sense? And it's not universal. Right? We, think, we think visually so that we tend to think that anything in front of us is going to be a visually massive phenomenon at the world, but there are a lot of blind animals. And we can't see a lot of what other animals can. Bees see into the ultra ultraviolet. Snakes and vampire bats see into the, ultra, uh, the infrared down to heat levels, so they can actually perceive by heat, which we can't do. Some fish can hear electric fields. Many animals are blind. Many animals have very limited sense of touch, such as the armadillo, which is armored everywhere on its body. Some animals, including humans, have an extraordinarily limited sense of smell if they have any sense of smell at all. We can only hope that vultures have a very poor sense of taste. But the one thing that is a universal among all vertebrates is the sense of hearing and the sense of balance. And they're closely related, separate senses, but both in our ears. Hearing is truly a universal sense. The earliest fossil vertebrates that we can find all had inner ears. And what's important about sound at an evolutionary level is that it's on a warning. It's on 24 hours a day, seven days. It lets you perceive things out of line of sight. So you can be a visual animal like a human being. But when you go to sleep, what warns you that something's in the tree with you or lying on the ground? Sound. A sound will wake you out of sound sleep. Right? A vision won't. So you have to shake somebody pretty hard. You're not going to wake up to a smell. I don't know how you taste something in your sleep. But vision is a 24-hour sensory system. There was a lovely, difficult to understand, but a very good piece of workbook by um, Beluti called The Auditory System in Sleep, which showed in animals and humans how the auditory system is constantly monitoring the background. And the, one of the ways that this works is that sound is processed, most of the really interesting basic thing, without relying on the cortex. Now, the cortex, uh, for those of you who know neuroanatomy or clinicians, this is going to be a review, but for most of you who don't know, when you look at a human brain, the big, very novelly part is the, is the cortex and the neocortex. That's where we do our thinking. That's where we do our association. That's where we store memory. That's where we do most of our visual processing. That's where we do our speech processing, all the complicated things that make us complex mammals and make us specifically human. But if you look at the auditory system, think of the auditory system from a frog all the way to a human, the basics are very, very similar. Auditory system, most of the primary things that happen, figuring out what a tone is, figuring out how loud it is, where that sound is coming from, doesn't require much brain at all. Most of the basic processing is done down in the brain stem long before it actually reaches the cortex, where you start doing things like thinking, I'd like to turn the volume up, or I hate that particular song, or I can't really understand what someone's saying. The auditory brain is very brainstem based. And this lets it happen very quickly. One of the things that is driven by the fact that the brain, that sound is going 24 hours a day, and it's very low down in the brain, means it's very fast. If you think about how you perceive the world, to recognize something visually can take you almost three quarters of a second. That, that sounds pretty fast. That's 750 milliseconds, thousandths of a second, which is the favorite scientific division of sound for biology, division of time for biology. It's actually a really long time. And to give you an idea of how slow vision is, if you repeat a visual image more than 10, 15 times a second, 
which means 100 milliseconds, 75 milliseconds per image. You can't even tell it's an image anymore. It starts flowing together. And luckily, this is the basis of cinema. If our visual system was any faster, we'd have to have much faster frame rates for video. Smell takes seconds. And you think about if you're checking on something that you're cooking, it can take you several seconds before you realize, I've added way too much oregano for that. Smell is a chemical sense. It takes a long time to bind. Taste is also extraordinarily long. If any of you out there like, the, like are connoisseurs of wine or beer, you know that there's a three or four second period of time between when you first put it in your mouth and the way the flavor finishes. This is because, again, it's a chemical sense. Even vision is a chemical sense. It is not just light comes in and fires off an earth. It goes through an extraordinary complex decoupled protein array, which takes a long time. And most of our visual perception has to go all the way through the brain to get to the cortex where it is then assembled into a lot of pieces. Sound works differently. Hearing works differently. Sound is a mechanical sense. Rather than having to have a photon come in, change the conformation of a protein, send a signal down the receptor to, find, to go through a bunch of ganglion cells, figure out how that affects the contrast, get sent down the optic nerve, through five or six more synapses before it starts putting vision together. Sound comes in, hits the eardrum, strikes a bunch of mechanical levers or ossicles, and moves fluid in the ear. And as soon as the fluid moves, it triggers hair cells, which are the basis of auditory perception. Hair cells are strictly mechanical. They have little hairs on top of them, and a kinocelium, which is a long stalk. The pressure wave moves it one way, and as soon as they wave, hits and bends that hair cell, it opens the channel, depolarizes the hair cell and fires. As soon as the wave goes back the other way, it closes it and, and hyperpolarizes it. And every time it opens and closes, that is one wave of sound. And by distributing all these hair cells different places along the inner ear in that little snail, snail shell shape process called the cochlea, you divide sound up by frequencies. This happens incredibly fast, where it might take you three quarters of a second to start recognizing something visually, 750 milliseconds. Well within 50 milliseconds, 200 of a second, you've already heard the sound, gone from your ear, hit your brain, and started categorizing the basic features of that sound. This is why that old game show, Blame That Tune, some people could just hit one note with a specific timbre sound, from a specific instrument, say, I know that song. Because your audio recognition is absolutely faster than any other sensory system that you have. This is a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because as a 24-hour alarm, this fast system lets us recognize sounds, identify them, and get an emotional response if we need it very, very quickly. Like one incident I had, I was running one night, and I tend to run at night because it hides a variety of sins. I'm not shaped like a gazelle. And I was, I was living in southern Rhode Island at the time. And I had some music on very quietly. But I started hearing something kind of padding. I took off my headphones and listened. There was nothing. So I started running again. And I thought I heard what sounded like quiet footsteps. I stopped again. But I'm looking around because something has my, my arousal. Very faint sounds that didn't quite match my footsteps suddenly changed the whole dynamic. I stopped listening to what I normally pay attention to or running. I stopped the task at hand, and I started shifting my attention to my environment. And when nothing came up after a few more seconds, I took off again. And suddenly I heard a splash and a snarl. And it was a coyote who was pacing. And the coyote looked extremely wet, bedraggled, embarrassed, and kind of slunk by. But in that moment, that probably five or six second moment was a whole little microcosm of auditory evolution and why it's important for us. The slightest change in something, especially when you're in an environment that's, that's potentially hazardous, like running at night along a road in the country, and suddenly you get signals going from your brain stem to parts of your brain that are and they're involved with the sympathetic nervous system, the arousal centers of your brain. Signals start going to the part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is not an emotional center, but it's what ties 
emotional value or valence to a vent. What it starts doing is getting the whole rest of your brain, getting all your attentional mechanisms to start focusing on sound if you can't see anything around you. So what you've got is a very fast, very, not primitive, but very basic built-in system that monitors your world for you and tries to keep you safe. And this very basic brain stem system is actually quite smart. If you think about it, one of the first, your brain stem understands physics a lot better than you do. One of the first things you probably learned about in terms of auditory physics was when you were a kid and there was a lightning storm and you were getting a little freaked out. And your parents probably came to you or a sibling and said, okay, you see the lightning, count. And as soon as you get to five seconds, that means that the sound was the thunder and lightning were coming from a mile away. But the thunder that you heard gave you a warning that there's something going on nearby. And the fact that it wasn't coordinated directly with the lightning reduces the alarm. Multisensory coordination between sound and other senses makes them very, very strong. But what you were able to do is the distance between an event and the time it takes for you to pay attention to it is your brain carrying out the physics of localization. Localization of sound is carried out very deep in the brainstem, but it's also a critical part of more intense cognitive. Excuse me, just getting some water. But what's the bad part of having a system that's running 24-7 and is really fast? Well, it's kind of ironic. Because if it's something's going on in the background, you usually don't pay attention to something. It's always going on. You suddenly hear, you know, you're, you're in your environment, and you say, this is quiet. My room right now is quiet. Everything is fine. But if I stop and listen to it, no matter where you are, if you're sitting in front of a computer or if you're in a car, there's a lot of sound going on. There is no place on Earth except a few very, very specifically set up laboratories that things are truly silent. Where I'm sitting right now, I can sort of hear cars about a mile away on the highway. There's a dog about halfway down the block, and I can barely hear that. The air conditioner cut in downstairs, and I can hear the fan of the laptop that just cut in. The phone is also hissing a lot. But this is background. If I'm not stopping and paying attention to all these things, all these things are going on without me needing to devote any kind of major brain, cognitive brain resources to it. So, we don't pay attention to sound unless something is very loud, very sudden, or we have consciously decided to pay attention to it. So the irony is that we don't pay attention to sound, and yet it's what guides our attention better than almost anything else. An example of this is something I'm sure you've all been through. It's called the startle. A startle is a very basic neurological behavior. And you can't do it with anything except a mechanical stimulus like sound or sometimes touch. You can't be startled by something you see. You can be frightened by it. You can be, you can, if you have something pop up in your peripheral vision, which is not good at form analysis, but is good at picking up motion, you will turn your head towards it, but you will not startle towards it. But if you're sitting in a movie theater and everything's quiet and all of a sudden there's a big banging sound, you will jump out of your seat. The startle is a very evolutionarily ancient defense reaction. It's only five neurons to go from your ears, all the motor neurons in your back to make you hunch up, jump, sometimes vocalize, and you'll do it in way less than 50, 50 milliseconds. That's a very basic emotional, attentional auditory circuit. But what do we pay attention to? It's nice that we have this 24-hour party going on, that we can monitor the world without paying much attention to it. But the really cool things that we're interested in and the things that usually cause the most fist fight at science conferences when, is the things that we deal with when we're making deliberate sounds we're paying attention to them. Things like music, things like speech, things like the noise in the environment. All of these things are elements that build up who we are as human beings. They form our culture. 
They form our daily behavior. These are the things that we choose to pay attention to while we're also processing all the auditory stuff in the background. The problem is that a lot of this stuff is still highly mysterious. And it's a bit of a jump, but I'd like to talk a little bit about music. The brainstem is handling all the basic features. And if you think about music, music is usually discussed as something that's only something humans do. It's a very complex behavior, and all humans seem to do it. Well, in evolutionary terms, that may not be true. It's been shown that primates use rhythmic communication. Beating on the chest is actually it's a non-vocal communication. Monkeys and chimps will beat on bars of cages or will beat on trees. Some people have described this brontophilia, which is basically love of the call love of thunder. Other animals seem to have music-like behavior. I've watched dolphins and, and small whales listening intensely to human music, mostly to sort of repeat it back to the dolphin trainers and annoy them at all hours. But in many levels, music is a very human thing. But we don't understand what it is. If you want to start a fist fight at a scientific conference, try and give a definition of music. When I've taught the course on the musical brain, I try to get students to define music, and I have a collection of about 200 different definitions. I have another 50 from colleagues who study auditory neuroscience and psychology and music and the brain. The problem is, to do science, you need an operational definition, and there aren't many. So bio biologically, we keep trying to come up with pieces of music so we can try to understand the whole thing. One of the most basic things about music, which ties into emotion, I'll give you some kind of a segue in the limited time we have, is the idea of consonants. That sounds good. Any of you with uh, musical training will know that a major chord sounds good, an octave will sound good. These are notes that sound smooth. Christmas music, you know, the, the seasonal problem that occurs. Everything is cheerful to the point that you just want to plug your ears after a few repetitions of Santa Claus coming to town. Can come to town. Consonant music is usually in what's called a major key. It's a very emotional response, although you do habituate to it, and after a while that positive emotional response will become something else. Usually annoyance or you can't wait for Christmas to be over which just shows how your emotional system will change if given repetitive stimulation. But it's a good way to look at a biological basis of music. And one of the best ways that, one of the best studies ever carried out on this was actually done in 1919 by Karl Malmberg. And it's a classic because it shows the difficulty of not only studying music, but of trying to get scientists to work with other people. The idea of consonants of sounds that sound good versus dissonance Sounds that sound rough together, minor keys are right on the edge of dissonance, they're tense. They can sound unhappy or they can make you very uncomfortable. But it's hard to get people to agree that consonants and dis on what consonant one dissonant. So what Malmberg did was he got a bunch of psychologists with no musical training and a bunch of musicians with no psychological training. And he had them sit down and say, I want you to rate these musical intervals and tell me what's consonant and what's dissonant. And all the psychologists agreed, and all the musicians varied quite a bit, but they could not agree. The problem is that there is a definition, a physical scientific definition of consonants, and then there's the artistic interpretation of consonants. You can say, I've met jazz students who have said that a seventh or an eleventh is really consonant at the right moment because it then gets resolved and allows tension, which is necessary in music. Whereas you talk to a psychologist in order for neuroscience, and they'll say, no, consonant means basically you have regular multiple integer relationships between the notes, and that's the way the brain says it's consonant. What Malmberg did was basically play these intervals on different instruments and then locked both groups into a room and would not let them leave during the course of the study for the period of one year until they agreed on a scale of consonants. And Malmberg was thus able to get a universally agreed upon scale of what is consonant and what is dissonance between psychology and musicians. It's a very basic finding, but it was one of the first and best attempts to unify 
something which is very subjective, a musical interpretation, a scientific one. But that's not very really biological basis. So one of the more interesting studies was done by Plomp and Lavelle in the 60s. They were wondering if there was a biological basis to the musical interval. And that basis, they found a very interesting one. And based on something called the critical band. A critical band is something that almost made me leave graduate school because it was explained to me by a psychophysicist. All critical bands are is a description of how the hair cells in the cochlea are laid out. The hair cells are laid out in frequency bands. So right near the where the sound comes into the ear is where all the high frequency sounds. This is why you lose all high frequency hearing because all those high frequency hair cells are right near the eardrum and they're taking the beating, most of the beating all the time. The low frequency stuff is at the apical end. The cochlea is kind of wide and floppy and responds best to low frequency sounds. But you don't hear, so that all 20,000 sensory hair cells in your cochlea do not hear specific frequencies. You can't tell the difference between 440 hertz and 441 hertz. It's broken up into these bands. So you can tell the difference between 440 hertz and 800 hertz, but that's almost an octave, or 440 hertz and 520 hertz, but you can't tell the difference between 440 hertz and 450 hertz. That's within the critical band. It's just like a filter function that blobs certain frequencies together. What Plop and Lavelle did was they looked at a Western musical scale, and they mapped it against the critical band, a rating of consonants, sound good, and dissonance. And what they found was that if an interval was more than one critical band apart, the sound was consonant. And if it was near one critical band, it tended to be minor key, slightly dissonant. And if it was within one critical band, it would sound really rough and really dissonant. So if you played a C and a C sharp, that's going to be dissonant, and that's right on the edge of being able to perceive a critical band, a biological basis for the underlying musical intervals. So this is not, this is only one tiny piece of music in the brain. But all those different intervals, the relationship between different frequency levels, the tension that will come up with two sounds that are near a critical band get projected through the auditory system and impact a lot of the emotional centers of the brain via the amygdala, via the, uh, the auditory cortex, and other regions of the cortex. So you can get emotional responses based on the differences in the musical intervals and how they distribute through the brain, both in terms of frequency content and time content. Uh, to give you some idea about how fine timing can really affect your perception of sound, favorite sound in the entire world, find a blackboard and run your fingernails down it. Or, if you don't have a blackboard, or if you're not as old as I am, go outside and get a metal rake and drag it across concrete. Either one of them is probably going to make you wish that you were deaf. The fingernail on the blackboard issue is about time. Originally, the study was done by Hal Bernard in 1986 called the Psychoacoustics of the Chilling Sound. And they looked at the worst sounds you could possibly hear, and their idea was that those particular sounds, the a rake on concrete, styrofoam on a balloon, or fingernails on a blackboard, you had frequency bands that were similar to the alarm call of some young primates. And their idea was that it was an evolutionary mechanism. We don't like to hear our own young screaming, so you have this very strong emotional response. You know, you'd hear the frequencies of a screaming young primate like a baby, and it would set your teeth on edge, and you'd be looking around seeing, okay, where's the baby screaming? Problem is, it was such a great story, no one ever tested it again. And it still, to this day, has not been published. But I did manage to run a study with one of my students last summer, which we haven't had time to publish yet because he's going off to grad school, in which we re-examined it. We took the fingernails on the blackboard and a few other sound samples. And we started playing not with the frequency, but with the time. And when you look at the fingernails on the blackboard, and you think about how you're making the sound, when you're talking, you're making a sound because you have these soft folds in your, in your larynx that vibrate when you push air over it. And the way that your larynx is set up 
you tend to have harmonic sound. This is one reason we tend to like harmonic sound in music, because our voices are quite harmonic. And whether you're speaking English, a supposedly non-tonal language, or something like Mandarin, which is a very tonal language, they both have a lot of harmonic overlap. This is how we've evolved. This is a sound that's pleasant to our ears. If you take fingernails and run them down a blackboard, your fingernails are flipping, slipping back and forth, not in a harmonic way, not in a regular way, but in a pseudo-random way. So it's almost harmonic because your fingernails are snapping back and forth as you're going down the surface. But there's enough randomness in there that it's not quite harmonic. And we started looking at the waveforms. And the only time that you see these kind of pseudo-harmonic waveforms is in when you have a voice or a musical instrument going completely out of control. Someone screaming at the top of their lungs shows the exact same time waveform as someone running their fingernails down a blackboard. So it's not the frequency content. It's not worrying about the consonance or dissonance of the fingernails down the blackboard or the rake on the concrete. It's micro changes in time, and we're talking way less than a thousandth of a second. The difference between that thousandth of a second making something harmonic and making it just inharmonic sends a signal to us that someone nearby is screaming so that their vocal cords are out of control. And that gives us the basis of the fingernails on the blackboard. It's the flip side of listening to constant music. Getting a strong emotional response of something that, in evolutionary auditory terms, it's very similar to someone in great pain or distress. Whereas when you're listening to music, especially very harmonic music or music that you've learned to like, you're hearing things, you're hearing auditory elements that are very similar to human normal speech of someone who's not in great distress. So just looking at these wildly different sounds, everything ties together with the emotional aspects of it, the physiological aspects, the evolutionary aspects of it. And I do realize that I am getting to the point that I'm going to run into time, and I could talk about this for the next 10 years, but I think it would be wise at this point if I cut the lecture part down and open up to some questions. Seth, uh, thank you. I, I'm sure callers as myself could listen to you for hours on end as your uh, students do with rapt attention and, and active listening. Uh, this is really, really great information. I can imagine that you elaborate on a lot of these concepts in your new book, The Universal Sense, yes? Yes, definitely. Okay. I mean, so if, uh, if you want more information, please, I've spent like a chapter on each of those topics and many other even stranger ones. Well, uh, I, I can appreciate how much material you have to hold back and how difficult it is to choose what you include when you're writing a text, having uh, been through the process you've been through recently with healing at the speed of sound. And what I just want to share with the callers, for those of you that have read my book with Don Campbell, Healing at the Speed of Sound, think of the universal sense as doing a much deeper dive on many, many of the topics that we explored. And you can get an understanding of that just listening to Seth now. So it's going to be a great extension from your reading there to uh, to dive deeper into the, the neuroscience and the emotion and the, the psychology of, of sound and, and music in our lives. So Seth, we've had um, a lot of questions, over 200 <laughs> submitted for this call. So obviously yeah. in the short time we have, uh, we're not going to have an opportunity to address them all. But I did want to share with our callers that I've, I've reviewed the questions and selected a cross-section that I think and hope will be of interest to many of you. And then we'll get some time to do a, a couple live questions as well. But one that's a nice segue since we've been really kind of touching how sound is so much about timing. Uh, we had a question that came in from Jim Shook in Texas asking, what is the biggest hindrance to processing sound at a normal rate? Knowing you know, that rate has everything to do with our understanding of language and now our appreciation for a like or dislike of sound, what goes wrong in the auditory system that affects rate processing? Um, that's a really good question, one that's not usually addressed. We have, you can process that at a blindingly fast rate, but what you can't process are the more complicated cognitive elements 
at a much faster than your normal speed of thought, which is sort of one thought, you know, one complete thought per second. The limitation is not so much for the auditory system as how it has to integrate with other systems. An example of this would be uh, earworms. It may seem like an odd example, but if you've all had the issue where you get a song just completely stuck in your head and you'd run and take a drill to your brain to stop it. It's not the frequency content of it. It's not entirely the familiarity of it. You hear things that you're familiar with all the time. One of the things that causes things to get stuck in your head and causes you to loop is the timing of it. If it is at a rate that is tied in with other with other systems, such as motor systems, if you can tap your fingers to it, if you're seeing a video that's really tightly linked to something, you start getting multisensory convergence. And all of a sudden, you start getting these weird loops in your head. The question of timing and sound is if you start violating your normal timing, it you reduce your, comp your ability to integrate with other cognitive resources. If someone is talking really, really fast and you can't really understand what they're saying, or they're talking at a very odd frequency or with an odd accent, you, you basically are devoting more and more resources trying to identify individual elements, and you literally lose the flow, which is what gives you the linguistic meaning. There is a tight coupling between a auditory flow rate and being able to pull meaning or emotional, or emotional response out of something. If you hear a very elegant, slow requiem suddenly played by some thrasher 10 times faster than normal, you're not going to have the same response to it. Uh, if you're probably going to find yourself unpleasantly aroused or angry at it because it violates your expectations of what you're hoping to hear. So if something is played too fast or even too slow, that will cause a lot of problems for proper cognitive processing. And the other thing to think about is take someone's voice and slowly slow it down. Even if you don't pitch shift it, you sort of start going, yeah, come on, come on, come on, it's work. So you have a narrow range for cognitive function, much more narrow than you have for auditory function. I hope that answers the question. That's a very short version of it. I, I, I think your answer speaks to something that's important because often, you know, people are thinking in terms of this auditory system being this discrete system. And, and it's not. It's in a relationship with cognitive processing and language areas in the brain and emotion make, make sound process, processing something very complex and what on the surface may look like an auditory issue is actually an issue with an associated system. Is that right? Exactly. So in, in, a, in a similar vein, um, we've had a question come in from uh, Suzanne Morris, who is in Virginia. And Susan, and, and this, is, this is an important one because um, the research that the ear and skin come from the same surface echoderm. So it's an embryological structure. So the question is, is what role of skin, what is the role of skin in hearing? What role does it play? Well, aside from the embryological one where they all derive, you basically derive from the ectoderm, uh, you actually perceive sound in many ways than just with your ears. Uh, this was highlighted to me last summer when I got to work with Evelyn Glennie. And if you don't know who she is, you should. She is a brilliant percussionist. Uh, she plays several thousand different instruments, and I was honored enough to be able to work with her on a project called the Just Listen Project, where she's going to be sort of the, the, the focus of a 3D IMAX film on sound. And the, I was able to watch her play this concert marimba. You know, she's this very petite woman. She takes her shoes off, and she throws her head back. She stands in front of the concert marimba, and she strikes and plays the room. It fills the whole room with vibration. And she's exposed, throwing her head back and exposing her neck to feel the vibration. She very carefully placed the resonator so that she could, and she takes her feet off, and her shoes off so she can feel the vibrations through the stage. She was also feeling vibrations on her shins and legs. The kicker is Evelyn Glennie is mostly deaf, and yet she is one of the most brilliant musicians you will ever hear in your life. She redefines what it means to listen 
and to hear music. Your skin is a very delicate receptor and stretched over hollows like your, your abdomen or pressed tightly against your bone, it will pick up a lot of different vibrations. And bone conduction itself is an extraordinarily important part of the auditory system most people don't pay attention to. It can be a lifesaver in that if you have sensory neural deafness, you can still mean that you basically have the system internally to be able to hear, but you've lost the tympanic pathway of your ear. But you can still hear by vibrating your skull. You can actually pick up vibrations through your entire skeleton, but a lot of it's mediated by the stretched tight membrane over the rest of your body, which is your skin. You, all, you do pick up a much wider range of vibration with your skin than you do with your ears. So it's an interesting and very understudied area. Um, I'm, I'm glad you, you touched on the bone conduction because uh, many of the callers that are with us are ABT providers or mm -hmm. they are uh, using uh, the listening program or adults using the listening program, and many of you are, are familiar with our bone conduction audio system in which we you know, deliver sound through not only the earphones as normal, but with an uh, oscillating transducer that's attached to the skull that then transmits the, the vibration through the skin into the bones directly into the cochlear system in the vestibule, uh, using these two natural pathways for sitting. One, one of our callers had asked you know, what our thoughts were on the use of bone conduction in listening-based programs. And you know, our experience, Seth, has been that we see a much faster response to auditory therapies when we do combined air and, air and bone conduction, and we see uh, improved and deeper emotional regulation. So we're, we're tapping into this non-classical auditory pathway and really touching people at a deeper level, uh, ha helping them in their self-regulation and overall arousal. Um, probably due to some of the relationships in the reticular formation in terms of the integration of what's happening between bone and air. So it's, uh, it's an area of great interest to, to us in, in, in answer to that. Uh, caller, uh, we're, we're big supporters of integrated programs. So what, what I'd like to do is uh, take a moment to open up to uh, a live uh, question or two. So for those of you that are calling in on phone, uh, you're going to have an opportunity to ask Seth a question live now. I apologize to those of you listening online um, that you're not able to do this, but for those that are on, on the phone right now, if somebody would press star 7 on your phone, that will unmute you. Go ahead and ask Seth a question, and then press star 6 to mute yourself, sir, and we'll, we'll go ahead and answer your question. So the phone lines are open, so anyone that would like to ask Dr. Horowitz a question, please press please press, press star seven. And I see that we've got a car here. Um, who, who do we have with us? Georgia Davis. Hi, Georgia Central Davis. Central How are you? Good to speak Fine, with you, Georgia. You. What's your question for patients, Dr. Horowitz? A number of my patients are concerned with tinnitus, and I'm yeah. wondering if um, Dr. Um, could um, comment on um, his experience, if Dr. Horowitz um, has experienced patients with tinnitus that don't seem to respond to other things, and um, if um, these therapies have been tried with people that have tinnitus, and if so, um, with what kind of success? Georgia, thank you very much for your question. If you press star six, that'll mute you, and Dr. Horowitz will go ahead and respond to your question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Tinnitus is a very variable condition, and I have very close friends who suffer from it terribly. And I mean, there are so many different treatments for them. Some of them have almost no effect, but some of them, it, it varies tremendously based on the specific type of tinnitus. I mean, tinnitus is one of the oldest described auditory problems. Um, the Emperor Tiberius wrote an entire tract about it. the only way he'd get relief from his tinnitus was to go to the blacksmith and sit there <coughs> and listen to, the, listen to them pound on the iron until the tinnitus finally went away, which is a treatment that's sort of being used now, using broadband noise to try to mask it or basically temporarily deafen them. 
The problem with that is one, it's temporary, and you're damaging other parts of the auditory system by being exposed to loud noise. Uh, Auditory-based treatment has gotten better. There are some systems that uh, are using very structured sound to try to mask or get your, your brain more than your ears to habituate the tinnitus tone. Those have mixed success. It depends on the type of tinnitus. That will often, it's usually more effective for people who have presbycusis and associated age-related tinnitus, which we all get as we get older. You'll have, I get it very occasionally, but I'm very paranoid about my ears, so I sleep with earplugs. Um, as opposed to my colleague, Lance Massey, who's a mu- musician, who you can blame for the T-Mobile room tone, who has the unfortunate habit of sticking his head between two very loud speakers, and at this point basically can't hear anything over 12 kilohertz. And he called me the other week and said, I have 10 kilohertz tinnitus, and it's killing me. What do I do? So there is another treatment, which is if you have very sing- single-tone tinnitus, you can come up with sounds that will just basically exhaust the hair cells right in that critical band, very narrow. Uh, it's something that we've been developing in Neuropop for a while. The problem is it doesn't work broadly. Uh, people who have had tinnitus from exposure to uh, explosions to construction or have noise-type tinnitus, it won't do anything for them. So it's a complex problem. It's sort of like saying, let's cure cancer. Well, there are thousands of different types of cancers and millions of people who are going to have variations. Tinnitus is a very personalized condition, and it requires people to work with the person to suffer a great deal, figure out specifically what the problem is, what the etiology, and then be able to look at some of the treatments, some of which might be as mild as give your ears a vacation. Put earplugs in for a day if you can. You know, don't completely block your ears. That's not safe. But reduce the overall environmental noise, and a lot of people with mild tinnitus show great relief. At the other end, there are people who actually opt to have their auditory nerve cut deliberately deafen themselves because the tinnitus won't let them sleep. So there's no simple answer for that, but a lot of the the treatments that are going on, the sound-based ones, are becoming much focused and are treating a broader group of people. And if we have any success with our particular one that I use on Lance quite often, I'll be sure and post it to ABT. Yeah, it's um, Seth. You know, as I've shared with you, my my wife may has a very particular type of tinnitus related to a bilateral cookie bite hearing. I have yeah. suffered myself, but fortunately recovered, I believe, through some of our music-based programs, but mine was less severe. But it, it is so variable, but can be so detrimental to so many. I know it's a wide area of interest and and you know, a number of companies and scientists working to find find the answers. And I, I certainly hope we, we get there and we will stay highly attuned to your, you and Lance's developments as uh, <laughs> You move as you move forward with that. Um, we are actually at the end of our hour, if, if we can believe this, and I, and I can tell you in advance, I'm going to volunteer Seth to come back for a follow-up call at some point because I think we're just scratching the surface on so many important topics. Um, but I, I've got a couple of announcements before we we wind up and and thank our guest. First, first of which is uh, we will provide contact information so that you can get a link to. Take a look at Seth's new book, The Universal Sense, which will be coming out from Bloomsbury in September of this year. Uh, we will also give you um, a link to his Facebook account and his Twitter account so you can reach out to Seth, ask questions, and, and be in contact with him. We will be posting that information this evening at the Advanced Brain Technologies Facebook page. So if you just go to facebook.com forward slash advanced brain technologies. Uh, We'll let you know how to get in touch with Seth there and also give you a link to uh, register for future ABT teleseminars. We have a number of of series available. Uh, Our next call uh, will be coming up on Wednesday, August 1st at 8 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be announcing our, our guest in the next couple of weeks for that one. Uh, and there will also be a link to hear a recording of this evening's call. So if you'd like to review 
use some of this information or send others to uh, enjoy this show, I very much encourage you to uh, go to advancedbrain.com to the community and take a look at the ABT teleseminars there. So I, I really want to thank uh, all of our callers, uh, all of our web listeners, uh, really calling in and listening from around the globe. And Dr. Horowitz, thank you so much for your time this you. evening. I can't wait to read your book. And so pleased to uh, have you involved with our team here at Advanced Brain Technologies and uh, look forward to sharing collaborative products with our listeners between ABT and Neuropop and Seth and Lance and our team. So uh, pleased to have you, your, your involvement, and uh, wish you a great evening. And to all of our callers, wherever you're at, have a great or a great night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Good night. Thank you for listening to the Advanced Brain Podcast with best-selling author, keynote speaker, and founder of Advanced Brain Technologies, Alex Doman. In the show notes, you can find links to all the resources mentioned in this episode. Please subscribe to the podcast from whichever platform you might be listening in. Of course, it's free to subscribe, and it ensures that every time we post a new episode, You'll find it right there waiting for you to listen to in your podcast app of choice. And for more information regarding the world's most innovative neuroscience-based music programs for optimal human performance, please visit advancedbrain.com.